back. And uh, I know this for this segment, we're going to talk about the effect on learning that ADHD has, because I think that's certainly, you know, when you're dealing with children, that's where the parents are most involved. And as you're saying, that transition from high school into further, or even dealing with high school and, and trying to get on to further education. That's as well as the lifelong learning that Absolutely. adults have to keep doing every single day. We never start mm -hmm. stop learning in this economy, eh? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you were starting to talk about some of the things yeah. that you found in your research. Well, uh, one of the main reasons why people with ADHD have such difficulty with learning um, is because they have what's called a weak working memory. Now, working memory, whenever I tell parents that, they're a little confused. Right. What do you mean by uh, that my child has a low working memory? Essentially, you can, I use a couple of metaphors to describe what working okay. memory is. It's kind of like short-term auditory memory. Um, however, it's more than that. It's what you can hold in your mind and manipulate at the same time, process, and then put into your long-term storage okay. of memory. So as an example, I'm listening to David talk right now, and I'm, that's my working memory, putting that into my you know, long-term memory. I'm choosing to manipulate that and think of a response, yes. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And things like this can be definitely more difficult. Like following a conversation can even be difficult if you have a low working memory. Right. Um, it can impact uh, following a lecture, uh, taking notes, writing is especially very much impacted by low working memory. Two uh, metaphors I like to use is that it's sort of like your cognitive working space. So if you can think of a, a desk where you hold your different ideas that you want, where you're planning different things and right. you're referencing different ideas, and it's also kind of like a funnel where all these uh, ideas and thoughts get channeled into your memory. Um, people with a low working memory have a much smaller desk. They can't hold as much uh, in their memory. As well, they also have a smaller funnel, a much narrower fun funnel. So how much they can take in at one time is very much reduced. So, so would that require then uh, uh, chunking some, uh, some ideas, uh, having them exactly. into smaller bits so that uh, mm -hmm. they're able to manipulate those ideas and then go on to the next exactly. piece? Exactly. One way it tends to um, kind of be shown in school is giving kids instructions. Kids with ADD, m the ones who have working memory issues, and um, right. it's very common to have them in ADD, uh, y if you try to give them, say, five instructions at one time, you'll see they'll just kind of freeze or they'll do just the last one you said because they'll remember that the best right, or whatever, right. uh, or they'll get upset because they're frustrated. So, for example, uh, for people with ADD, a great thing to do is give one instruction or two and then let them do it and then give another one and let them, you know, and right. let them do it or write it down for them so that they have it at least to, to make reference to because they're not able to remember it or encode it as quickly in their long-term memory to mm -hmm. remember it when you're done talking. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of things can be done done to help uh, children in the school environment cope a lot better, uh, gi whether giving notes ahead of time prior mm -hmm. to lessons, giving outlines that children can reference to, giving longer uh, test taking time is a big one, as well as maybe giving some reference materials that they can look to, um, maybe limiting how much can be deducted from things like spelling and grammar, because things like the process of writing, for example, we take it for granted because we do it so often every right, day, right. but it's really a very complex process of retrieving things from your memory, uh, encoding them into a written response, uh, maintaining the rules of grammar, answering the question that you're trying to originally answer. It's a lot to juggle, and it can take people with ADHD a much longer time. Right. So when you're doing the diagnosis, then, are you, you know, I, each child would be individual in terms of what they're particular what need. needs would mm -hmm. be so mm -hmm. what you're trying to do is train them to work with what they've got mm -hmm. so that they can they can uh, maximize the capabilities they exactly. have exactly we really try to help play to the child's strengths so if they have a good uh, visual memory and they have good uh, uh, visual uh, encoding for things into their memory you try to give them as many visual cues as you can put things into a more visual format using charts and graphs if they're a visual learner if exactly. yeah, yeah if they're a visual learner if mm -hmm. they have other strengths uh, you want to use maybe their auditory strengths instead uh, trying to explain things to them in a verbal format uh, transferring their textbooks into audiobook format okay. that was a huge deal for me once I got that to happen I could take in information like 10 times 20 times as fast as I could before Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so so it's, it's identifying where their strengths are, and then mm -hmm. and then trying to uh, manipulate yeah. the program to fit those. Exactly, yeah. and it can exactly. be difficult to figure out where a child's strengths are. So what you really want to do is get a psychoeducational assessment. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times the schools are overburdened with a long waiting list for these right. assessments because there's a lot of students that don't fit our general school structure for how kids are supposed to learn. A lot of kids have very unique needs and very unique strengths. Um, so you could also obtain one privately as well. 
Okay, but mm -hmm. that, that but there's a cost to that, and not that's not yeah. It can usually be about yeah, fifteen hundred to twenty two hundred dollars for the if, or you can wait in line, and it can take a couple years to get assessed. But the earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. It's really important. Um, however, if you just need that diagnosis to start getting the supports, uh, you can also go through a psychiatrist. Right. Um, oftentimes, they are covered by OHIP. Um, so th you just ask your doctor to refer you to a psychiatrist. Uh, for example, in this area, Dr. Kenny Handelman uh, mm -hmm. does that, or Dr. Mulder. They do great ADHD assessments uh, kind of within a shorter time span. And then you can get the assessments at school that fast. Really? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so that's a much shorter process than, it is. than waiting yeah. for it. You're just getting a lot less information. You're not, it's not as specific, but it's good enough to start getting the supports, which is the most important part. Because I would think that if, if people are sensing that there's an issue, as you say, the younger the better because uh, mm -hmm. often, as, as you say, you were diagnosed just five years ago. Yeah. That must have been incredibly frustrating in oh school. Oh my goodness, yeah. In university, everything seems so difficult. And then after my diagnosis and I started getting the right supports, uh, usually <coughs> universities have a wonderful center for students with disabilities. Uh, they can kind of get your you know, uh, textbooks in different format, time and a half on exams, things like that. And all of a sudden, you're actually learning. Um, for me, uh, one of the biggest things, and for some clients who actually can kind of in advance try to do this, is trying to get the information that you're going to be learning before the class actually starts. And this is great if parents can do this, they can do this for their children. Mm -hmm. But just teaching their kids the terms so that when the teachers are teaching the whole concepts, when the kid knows the terms and has time to slowly encode it, it, it they will learn the terms in class much more efficiently. And in, in terms of the information in the educational community, mm -hmm. uh, how, how is it getting, because you say it's only, well, 20 years ago is when we started to have good brain scans, so it's still pretty new, isn't it, in terms of understanding what to do in the uh, definitely. In schools? Yes, and you might still get a lot of doctors who just say right away, here are the drugs, good luck, and unfortunately drugs can be really good, and for 80% of people they can work fantastically, but they usually leave like kind of unaddress the organizational issues, time right. management issues, all sorts of things that just having better focus, they don't change your habits mm -hmm. that you've developed over time. And just to add to that, um, also sometimes side effects of these medications, mm -hmm. although no doubt they are very effective at controlling a lot of the symptoms of right. ADHD, create some additional problems, whether it be insomnia or mood problems. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, there's sometimes comorbidities with other disorders, for example, Tourette's. Uh, where these medications can actually worsen the symptoms of Tourette's, for instance. So sometimes it's not always a possibility, and you have to look at different measures in order to help the child cope. Right. Okay, and actually we're just about at our next break, so thank you very much, David. And uh, I, I, unfortunately, I guess you're leaving us. Oh, uh, yes. Well, and thank uh, you. we'll have someone else in your place. Amy will be coming back to, be, uh, to sit in your spot, and mm -hmm. I know we'll do a wonderful job. And we'll be talking we'll about education. <laughs> and we'll return right after the break to hear more about ADHD and what can be done about it.